What do you think stops so many people from seeing it? Well, I think that it is awesome. It is awe-inspiring. And I think we just live in such a cynical age with, with so many people devoid of feelings of awe. It's just kind of beaten, it beaten out of us. I mean, I'm grateful for many things about Bitcoin. I think one of them is it's just wonderful that I need not be among the people who are devoid of feelings of awe. I think that relates to another question, which is why people underestimate Bitcoin so much. And what do they underestimate most about Bitcoin? And that one's easy, right? That's easy. The ferocity of the Bitcoin community for Bitcoin. That, I can tell you, that is underestimated. I don't speak for the community. I speak for myself. But I think there are two core views of the community. The first view, we'll call it the individualist view, is that money is not the root of all evil. Money is a root of all sovereignty. It's the authority to act in the world as we see fit, as long as we don't harm others. Money is a property right. And since we've traded our time for money, when money is printed, our time is stolen, and that is not okay. The second view, I would say, is the community view. Money is the greatest force for good in the world today. It's an arc. It's designed to help the most vulnerable, the most unprepared, escape the accelerating fiat flood. And it's, it's raining outside pretty hard. So yeah. let's get as many of those living on society's fringes, not just in the US, but everywhere. Let's get them in the arc. Let's get them in the arc as soon as possible, and nothing is more important. What I would say, though, is that these two views of the Bitcoin community, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, every single Bitcoiner I know holds both of them in their, in their minds. You know, one of the things that really got me going and a lot of Bitcoiners going was last March when Kashkari, who's president of the Minneapolis Fed, he said, there's an infinite amount of cash in the Federal Reserve, an infinite amount of cash in the Federal Reserve. You could almost hear the other 11 Fed presidents saying, shh, Neil, you're not supposed to say that part out loud. Right. Right. The American people are really smart. Right. They, they may not have gone to the same schools as Neil or worked at the same firms as Neil, but, but they're smarter than Neil. And one thing they definitely can do, they can do division. If I got fifty thousand dollars of life savings, I don't really know what that fifty thousand is out of. But I have a sense. Right. And now the guy in charge of the money is telling me the denominator is infinity. I don't need to know calculus or theory of limits to know that my 50,000 divided by infinity, that means my 50,000 bucks is, is worthless. Why would I hold my life savings in something with infinite supply? I mean, I might as well go to the beach and exchange it for grains of sand. They're in infinite supply too. So I think what Kashkari is really telling us is that fiat should come with a warning label, like cigarettes comes with a warning label. But instead of the cigarette label saying, you know, these are bad for your health, the fiat warning label would say, these are bad for your, your wealth. Right. And the cigarette pack has this, you know, the skull and crossbones on the outside. I'd like to see the treasury start printing the infinity sign on our cash. So if you got a $20 bill under each the numbers in all the corners, it would just you know, have a red warning label that says divide this number by infinity. Remember, as I said earlier, a central bank can control the supply of money. They can't make their people value it. So, you know, I think that Bitcoin is massively under, underestimated. And I think that's understandable. I mean, I think you underestimated it. I underestimated it. Until we go deep down our own version of the rabbit hole, it's, it's underestimated. I mean, the financial establishment underestimates. Again, I did until I didn't. Um, you know, I give them all mulligans. They just, they just haven't put the time into it. I mean, Jamie Dimon calls it uh, a fraud, right? Yet it's much more real than fiat. Larry Fink calls Bitcoin an index of money laundering. Uh, I think it's more akin to an index of money printing. Warren Buffett calls Bitcoin rat poison. That one's shameful. That one is shameful because Bitcoin is giving life, not taking it. It's giving life right now to tens of thousands in El Salvador and Pakistan, Venezuela. It's giving life. It's not taking it. And soon to be millions and with Strike and NYDIG and Lightning, soon to, be, soon to be billions. So fraud, money laundering, rat poison, Bitcoin. It's just intellectual laziness. I think people also underestimate just how unstoppable it is. It is Bitcoin is just unstoppable. Um, I mean, it'll have fits and starts as it has, of course, that's for sure. But it is here to stay forever. And that's for a simple reason that, that it's open source. It's open source. I mean, China, last time I checked, pretty powerful place. They basically banned it. Price rallied in their face. India, 
basically banned it. A lot of people lived there last time I checked, basically rallied in their face. Pakistan banned Bitcoin, banned mining. It all went underground. Usage exploded. Mining in Pakistan after the ban exploded. It, it, it was so profitable to mine in Pakistan that eventually the government themselves, a province, started a Bitcoin miner and they, they changed the legality of it. So, you know, these are the four or three of the four most popular populated countries in the world effectively kind of said Bitcoin's banned. We're making new highs kind of even as we speak. And I think about our own country. I really don't think a ban is in store because I don't think it's possible, but we can just, we can just go there for a second. Let's just say the US banned Bitcoin. It wouldn't stop it. It would accelerate it. Remember, we, we kind of tried this once in 1935. We, we, we did actually ban and confiscate gold. Remember what I said before, you actually could do that. You can't confiscate Bitcoin, you could. And in the ensuing period of time till today, the dollars depreciated about 85% versus gold. So it just, it just didn't work. I Imagine trying prohibition today, right? I mean, that's alcohol and it would be unenforceable. Can you imagine yep. trying to ban people from holding their own money? You mean, forget it. it. No way. And it won't happen anyway because it's, it's private property. And we've got pretty good rules in our country about private property. And it might even be speech because it's code. So it might even be protected by the First Amendment. But regardless, Michael, none of this matters. None of this matters. Because with regards to confiscation, if you really boil all this down, what is it? It's just a password. It's just a password to a private key. And that password can easily be stored with phrase memorization in my head. So confiscation's off the table. Remember, gold has a vault. You can take the vault. Good luck confiscating my memory. Yeah, and given all of this, it seems like individuals and corporations are being forced to take action. Yeah, look, I think everybody now has a choice, which is a, which is a good thing. And it's a choice they make, you make, I make, and everybody gets to make on their own. You can stay on the fiat standard that's available in which some people get to print new units of money in unlimited size, just not you. Or you can move to the Bitcoin standard in which no one gets to do that, including you. We finally got a monetary system governed by rules, not rulers. And given that I've made my choice, you have to make yours and everybody at this conference has to make theirs. I will tell you, I am working tirelessly towards a future with a globally adopted inflation-proof common currency for the world. One that billions can opt into as their peaceful weapon of choice. You know, Satoshi solved the Byzantine general's problem. Bitcoin solved the military general's problem. And when you think about trends in anything, you're a tech guy, all you got to do is follow the brains. Even more than the money, the brains know first. Where are some of the smartest people in the world shifting their careers to focus? Where are some of the best developers in the world going? They're going to Bitcoin. And I'd never underestimate the power of a mass movement of developers. And don't underestimate the ferocity of the emerging decentralized class, us Bitcoiners. I mean, just like early encounters with the printing press and antibiotics and aqueducts and the internet itself, they were incalculably underestimated. People incalculably underestimate Bitcoin, totally understandably. But you, Michael, MicroStrategy, your colleagues, I think you're doing everybody an incredible service by having this conference by having this talk and creating a platform for these ideas to be introduced. So look, you've just heard from a guy with a background in financial services and a background in, background in Bitcoin. I straddle both worlds. So I offered my perspective, but it's, it's only my perspective colored by my experience. You're a fellow founder, you're a fellow entrepreneur, you're a fellow CEO. You've got your perspective, you're a tech guy. You know, what, do you, what do you think about this? And what do you think I've said and what I've missed? Well, you know, Ross, I, I think there's clearly a macroeconomic wind that's blowing. And I don't think any corporation can afford to ignore it anymore. Uh, we've all got to act. You've acted. MicroStrategy's acted. Um, the reason we're having this conference is to help everybody else figure out what they should do 
And uh, I want to thank you for sharing all this. This has just been mind blowing. It's just awesome. I'm, uh, I'm just so inspired. And, and uh, I didn't realize there are so many institutions that were moving into this space as aggressively as they are. What a difference a year makes.